So welcome everyone and welcome to tonight's Tuesday Twirl Talk, Twirl Talk on Tuesday. And after a couple heavy weeks and some real needed discussion, um, tonight we have gone into practice. And this is a really common um, pitfall for a lot of people. Either they figure it out really well or they struggle with it a lot. So what I wanted to do was present a panel to you that would have a wide um, array of discussion so that we could talk about what works, what doesn't work, um, anything like that. So the people that are the panelists tonight, and thank you so much. I'm so thankful to count these people as friends and colleagues and former students and um, a really good discussion. And I think that it'll be helpful for the parents, the athletes, the coaches that are asking for, how do I do this better? So first on this call is Wendy Campbell Mall. And Wendy was at the first world championships where she won a gold, a bronze medal and has a huge legacy in a twirling family. And um, even though her history might go back a bit, I think that some things are continuous, and let alone that she's a judge and um, her sister still is running the Valley Baton Club. And I think that it's really valuable information to gain through the generations. So thank you, Wendy, for choosing to join us tonight. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, next up is legendary coach um, of every single level, every single athlete. And even though she's an amazing coach, she's also an amazing mom. And so it's Cheryl Wimberly. And um, I'd like to think that Cheryl and I are, and it's probably in my own imagination, but Cheryl and I have a kinship of sorts in that there's a lot of things that we connect about from theories and philosophies and how we do things. And I really look up to Cheryl and the work that she does and the person that she is. So Cheryl, oh, thank you. your information is really gonna be valuable tonight. Thank you, me to you too. And next up, um, Twirlebrity, I love the new phrase, Twirlebrity, Lexi Duda. Me too. <laughs> and so we are lucky to have Lexi on it. She's just recently graduated from Maryland, and we were just hearing about her fabulous job and entered the adult world. But the legacy that Lexi leaves in twirling is amazing from not just the championships that she's won, but the person that she's been. And I've always seen her interact with the younger kids and the older kids. And as a U.S. team coordinator for the International Cup Championships, Lexi knows that I had like my own little personal love fest with her because I loved her time management skills. I loved the way that she worked when she had to and didn't work when she didn't have to. And I just really want her to be able to share some of that wisdom because I think she was really smart about it. Thank you, Lexi, for joining us tonight straight out of work. <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you. And finally, selfishly, I have one of my own former students, Grace Winterberg. And Grace um, has been an International Cup team member, was on the U.S. team as a soloist and team competitor at the last World Championships. But as her coach, I was able to watch her navigate several challenges, and one of them being a solo competitor trying to figure out how to practice alone, how to stay motivated alone, how to find a facility alone, and how to be a smart practicer. So those are our panelists tonight, and I just wanna thank them for joining us, because I think that everyone wants to figure it out. Kids wanna figure out how to have fun. Parents wanna figure out how to not like bang themselves in the head to get this done. And coaches want better athletes. So we're gonna start with some questions. The first half hour, I'm gonna chat with these, our panelists. The next half hour, I'll open it up to the gallery. And don't forget to go ahead and mute yourself. If you're not one of our panelists, put yourself on mute so that I don't hear that background noise. And then if we hear a little bit of background noise, you may have to mute until I ask you a question. So let's go ahead and start, Wendy. Let's start back in the day. And what did you feel was your mom and your practice philosophy? How did you start deciding that I need to practice and did you ever realize it was going to wind up where it did? Well, I had always been intrinsically motivated to practice. So that was never really a problem for me. 
Um, you know, I, I internally I wanted to do it. Um, but I think there were three words that my mom and my dad uh, really held true to me that I still find um, valuable today, which is control, discipline, and consistency. And so I really put that into my practice. And I think that's something that still um, resonates with today's twirlers in that control your practice needs to be controlled to where you're getting your routine and tricks perfected. You have to have the discipline to keep at it even when it gets tough and realize the times that it is tough that it's okay that it's tough and if you need to back off, um, that's fine, but you're building the discipline in yourself um, to stay motivated and focused. And then lastly, the consistency in building your stamina and knowing that the way you practice is gonna be the way you perform. So if you're going to be practicing in a 50% mode, then you're probably gonna go out and perform with a 50% success. So finding um, control, discipline, and consistency in your practice is gonna be important to finding that success once you get onto the competition floor. And I think you know that still resonates with me today when I think about work and just my own life. I always go back to CDC. Thank That's you, my wonderful. Thank you to my mom and dad. <laughs> I hope that people are taking notes because I think that that is something to remember. And you're a judge now, and you're really effective in the judging world. So when you're judging, can you see that in the athletes in front of you? Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'm glad you bring that up, Kyle, because as a judge, you're going to get a half a point more, at least from me, if you are engaging me. So practicing your performance skills are just as important as practicing your twirling skills, that eye contact, um, facial expressions, smiles, looking like you're enjoying your performance is going to make me take notice um, of your performance as well. So I, I think that's really key when you're practicing as well is to practice your performance qualities. Um, and you got, you're really lucky at this point when I was twirling, you didn't have video cameras and iPhones and all of those types of things. And you have that luxury today to video yourself or have a friend video you and go back and watch your performances and critique yourself um, and say, hey, you know, I could do better with not only this particular twirl, but I could do better with my eye contact or my smile or my projection um, and really engage your audience and your um, judging panel. I remember when I was competing um, to really, when I looked in the judges' eyes, I could really kind of all of a sudden just see them sit up and take notice a little bit more. So I, I think that's, as athletes, and now myself on the judging side, um, we care about the twirls that you're doing, but we also care about your performance. And those types of performance qualities are gonna get us to care about your performance even more. Those are qualities that Grace and Lexi bring to the table as performers as well. So um, I would encourage you to go out and find video of Lexi and Grace because they are quality performers and they bring those performance qualities um, in. And I know that they practice them. That was not something that they just turned on, um, you know, when, when they sat, when their set number was called. Right. So bringing those qualities into your practice, I think are just as important as learning how to do a proper thumb flip or blind catch. Well, thank you. And you know, it's so funny what you said, Wendy, because when I think about back in the day for me, my personal challenge was, I will take that judge who never smiles, and I will make that judge smile. So that was like my own little like gig of like, I'm going to be that. So this naturally leads to Cheryl, because Carissa, her daughter, was the one that I would watch and I always felt like she was performing just for me. And I remember one artistic twirl, dance twirl that I judged that she was in my face. And it's like, I'm gonna show you how fabulous I am. So Cheryl, as a coach, when you're talking about practice, could you just go back to the basics? 
of the advice that you give and the, the outline that you give on why practice and how practice? Yes, definitely. Um, first of all, and I've thought a lot about this in the past week, I mean, I think about it all the time, but the first thing I feel like as an educator, um, which us coaches are, is once again, you have to assess each individual and you have to assess their personalities because not every child is the same. So to reach them, there are different ways. However, you're exactly right. Every single, single one of my lessons and every single practice starts with wrist twists. Every single one, we have a set that we do. We have five twists, we have five off the thumb, we have five into the elbow. And to explain to the students that the reason we do these is because this is what leads to the basis of all bases, which is your thumb tosses. And, you know, again, if you can give a child a reason for something, then it makes it more likely that they do it. But I demand that when I teach lessons, when I teach practice, and I do a lot of FaceTime lessons, even before this, we start every single lesson with this basics. We go into figure eights at the, at the side. We do 10, we do back in. Uh, figure eight thumb tosses. Then I have a drill that I do back in thumb toss, catch back in, catch left, the other side, blind, blind, back catch, back catch. The whole thing, once they learn it, like the first lesson, I mean, now, okay, when I start a basic student, that's we start with the wrist twist and maybe that's as far as we get, you know, but I'm talking as the student progresses through all these levels, they still, every lesson, I don't care who they are, they still start with those basics my teams, everything, we start with those basics. And then we go into a thumb series exercises. I do three thumb tosses, catch left, three backhands, two, two, one, one, all the way through. Full flourishes, fast as you can go, and you know, into their thumb tosses. And I work, I can't tell you how many times I work, elbow into your side, thumb up your chin. And so that they know that at the beginning of this, that this is what they do. So that, you know, I have a lot of lessons that it's just basically to teach them how to practice. And a lot of times lessons become practice so that the students realize that, okay, it's not just about this trick. It's not just about, you know, this level or anything else like that. We always have this scenario that we, that we um, start with and then we move up. It only takes five minutes. It only mm -hmm. takes five minutes because I get a lot of people that say, you know, I don't know how to do this. Now I'm talking just handling right now. I'm not getting into stretching right now. That's another thing that we do. But then the next thing I do on the levels of tricks is I start with spins. I start with foot positioning. So I start without the baton, take the body through it with the baton, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then we build up and we play games building up. And and then with that, the next thing is, is when you're moving the, the student through progressive levels, the biggest thing that I, again, learned from my kids, my own kids, is, you know, playing games are so important. You know, I started as a coach and, and as a twirler and as a competitor myself, and I started, and I remember at one point, um, I'm going to skip my competitive career, but I'm going to go into when I was coaching, and, and I was about 18 or 19. And for some reason, I was hired to teach a lot of coaches' kids. And I saw, like, different things going on there. I saw coaches that didn't pay enough attention to their own kids. I saw coaches that wanted their kids to be better, if not more wonderful than they were. And then I saw, you know, the ones that, like, just kind of relaxed and did it okay. And I remember myself as a parent, like when I became a parent, I thought, oh my gosh, how do you know what's right? And as a parent, and that's what you deal with, how do you know what's right? As a coach, how do you know how far to push, how fast to push? And that's a very fine line that as a coach, you have to go back and forth again and again. You have to make sure that your student, whoever you're dealing with that time is engaged, that they understand. There's gonna be times that they're just like, you know, had a bad day at school. You got to figure out how to make them laugh. You got to figure out how to get them through that. You got to figure out how to fix their soul, how to fix their brain, and now get the baton back in the hand. And I know that might sound deep, but it's true. And then the next thing you do is, okay, 
I'm never satisfied. And I let them know that right off the bat. I kid with them. Now, you know, that was great, but you know, now I want you to do this. And then now instead of drudgery, it becomes fun for them. And, mm -hmm. or at least I humor myself and think it's fun for them. <laughs> but you have to, you have to, as a coach, go through that with them a lot of times. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. yes, I'm going to jump a lot of stages right now. Yes, I want you to catch your triple. Okay, but you know, I'm on my single. Well, then we have this game that we play. We turn it into a game. It's, it's not just about the trick. It's like throwing it up straight. Okay, now you're afraid of this trick throw it away from you. Just try the trick. Just try the trick. Mm -hmm. I don't care where the goes. And then it's like, try the trick. And now let's see if it can, you could do the trick before the baton lands. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. Now, can you tag it? Can it get so close? That, oh my gosh, you could have caught it. Cause a lot of times I find kids are so disappointed when they didn't catch it. It's, it's like, instead of like, Oh, I almost caught it. And that is a stage in itself. Right. And then it's, hey, I caught it. And then it's like, hey, you know, before we put it on the floor, it was, I had the game three in a row or mm -hmm. five. Mm -hmm. And then, or you don't do it yet. We just bring it down and not as a failure, as a performance ready. Yes, so right. there's a difference. Right. So do you think, so, sorry to interrupt. Do you think that the natural phrase is that consistency builds comfort? It and, does. It does. And, and so um, I, I picked up the phrase tag it from you, that that's a success in itself. When you can just touch it and you tag it, you make that a step in the success. So I could talk to each of you just an hour alone. So let me go just a second to Lexi. So Lexi, because you had a mom that was a coach also, how did you develop your own practice regimen that you were able to own? I feel like even at a young age, I wasn't made to practice. I practiced because I loved it. So from there, as I got older, I felt like I was disciplined enough by myself to want to keep practicing. And my motivation over anything, I would say, wasn't to go out on the routine and have a perfect, well done job, anything like that. More times than not, I was more excited for what I could put out on the floor and what new things that we could create and what would just be different. Um, I just love playing with different tricks and playing with just like any new roles, stuff like that. I was more excited to have myself get something. So like in practice, I will routinely practice something over and over and over again because like I am stubborn in the sense of when I think something's cool and I want to get it, like I will stay in the gym until I get it. I will work as hard as I can until I will get that trick so I can put it out on the floor for people to see. So do you think a consistent thing like with you and Lex and you and Savannah is like practice is play and you want to be able to play with it? Yeah, I think it's important to have fun with it. Um, but I also think it's important to like, practice so I like to play with it like what I'm going to do on the floor I like to practice my routines and everything but I also make sure that with that I do leave myself some time to play with new tricks and to play kind of like new roles and stuff things that I want to get that I know I'm not quite ready to put out on the floor yet so it's kind of like a happy medium of everything because like I'm gonna practice what I need to for the competition and everything like that but you're always going to keep learning and you're always going to want to keep improving. So I think it's great to keep challenging yourself to the next level and keep going. Absolutely. And you could tell that, and you have that inner drive. So Grace, being a person who had to practice solo, how, what drove you to get to the gym? And were there days that you said, nope, not feeling it. So what made you get to the gym? So I really was never serious about baton. I played every sport under the sun until eighth grade, and they were always team sports. Uh, hang on just a second. Charlotte, if you could, Charlotte Wong, if you could mute yourself, that would be wonderful. Go ahead, Grace. Sorry about that. You're good. So both of my parents played sports in college, and my sister did too, and they played team sports. 
And when I was serious about baton, I walked into the gym and I was like, well, I have no teammates that can push me to be my best. And I was my coach, Stephanie's only student. So I was completely alone with Stephanie, but I really started to become passionate about my practice after my first US trial. So when I went, I was 12 and I was doing an elite routine with a spin illusion in it. And I, it took me like 15 tries to pass my compulsories. I don't, I think the judge felt sorry for me at that point. So <laughs> I, knew, I knew I did not belong there. And I was in dead last after like the first round and I was unbelievably embarrassed. And I begged my mom to drive me home because I did not want anyone to see me. But my mom dragged me into the stands and said, no, we're going to watch your competitors. And I had no idea what an aerial was. So I drew a stick figure of someone doing an aerial and said, I'm going to learn this. And I wrote a whole list of all my competitors' tricks and said, you know what, next year I'm going to come back and I'm going to do this. So I went to trials next time when I was 14. And again, I got dead last. So I was so defeated by that. But I really owe this all to my mom because she helped me train my brain. So that was the biggest thing that pushed me into the gym. So I made it a promise to myself that I was not going to embarrass myself again and that I was going to be on that world team. So every day when I woke up, I had a performance statement and it was taped to my mirror and it said, I still remember it. It was, I am an elite twirler at the best in my age group. I'm going to win because of my good tricks and flawless technique. And I said that to myself every morning and I, you know what, I really, that was what drove me. So it was, yeah, you know, like when I would get into the gym, I would train my brain first and I knew how to get myself ready to go. And that was what drove me to be my best. And, and watching you through that process, it's, it's as a coach, watching a parent that knew what to do and how to handle it with the daughter. So, um, I, that story is so good for so many people because people think that people, people are born with a gift. And instead, like, you know, we've talked, I'm one of those people. I had to get it in my head first. And my mom was a pusher. So as a coach, I had a lot of discussions with parents because nowadays they don't want to push their child. Well, she doesn't really want to do it. And it's like, I get it from a balancing standpoint, but at least in my case, and Wendy, I'm going to come back to you. Like my mom decided if I was going to do something, I'm going to do it great. And so she made sure that I got the time. And in those days, I was lucky to get in a little elementary gym, like on Monday nights. The rest of the time was outside or we're in the living room, wherever we could do it. So um, I think that there comes a point, the common thread in this group is that, like, it takes parental involvement until the point that you're able to own it. So Wendy, did you, how important was your mom to your practice regimen? Um, you know, my mom was important to my practice regimen, but she also did find that good balance of where to kind of let me handle things and allowed me to make the decision to kind of draw her in. Um, I, I think too, as athletes, you have, Time management is one of the skills that you're really managing because you're going to school and you're practicing and you might be involved in other activities. So you need to be able to make that baton appointment with yourself. And the way I did that was um, when I got done with school, I would come home and practice usually about an hour and then have dinner and then work on my homework afterwards. And sometimes if I didn't have that hour, if I was involved in something else, I was still training myself because I was involved in cheerleading or song leading or whatever. And even though you don't have a baton or a stick in your hand, you're still working on performance qualities or timing and rhythm. So um, don't think that just because you don't have your baton in your hand, you're not still training yourself or training your body. Um, I also really like what Grace had to say about training your brain. There were some times when you couldn't be outside. Um, I always loved roles, and so I would find corner in our garage and work on my roles if I couldn't be outside practicing. But mental practice is just as important. I never practiced on the Friday before a competition. 
um, I always would do mental practice that day and just lay in, find a quiet spot usually in my bedroom and I would just run routines through my head. And what's amazing about your brain is it doesn't let you screw up. Right. If you're practicing, if you're practicing in your head, you're not going to drop. Right. You're not going to flub your backhand illusion catch. You're not going to miss your four blind because your, your brain is, doesn't work that way. So your mental practice is just as important. And I think my mom really helped me understand the mental part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I usually would go out and get myself warmed up and get about half, halfway into my practice session before I would call her to come out. And she usually would ask me, what do you want me to critique you on today? Or you know, what, what are you working on today that I can evaluate and help you with? Or, you know, um, what kind of input should, could she provide for that? I also have, I wanna add on to Grace's um, comments earlier too, because, and I, I don't know that a lot of people know this, but in, when I was 14, I had an amazing year of twirling. I won three championships at state, um, solo strut and dance twirl, same at regionals, went to um, USTA nationals and won uh, the junior solo and competed in the finals. And then um, I, I trolled MBTA at the time as well and went and got second at their St. Paul Winter Carnival competition and then second place again at, at AYOP in the big twirl off. And so I had this amazing exactly. year of twirling. And when I finished, I was just worn out. Okay. And I didn't want to twirl anymore. I, it wasn't that I hated baton or anything like that, but I was just tired. Mm -hmm. And so I took the entire 15 year off. And I don't know that people know that. I didn't twirl when I was 15 at all. And then in um, the early 1980s, when they announced the world championships coming on, I'm like, hey, this I want to do. And so I went to my, and, and I know it broke my mom's heart. And I should get a little teary about that, but um, I know it broke her heart when I stopped twirling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she let me do it. Yeah. And then I was able to come back in 1980 and make the world team and be a part of that inaugural process, which I know made her really proud as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but look at look at COVID. Look how perfect this is. And that's yeah. what we've said. Like we have this year and the universe aligned for whatever reasons, whether everybody figures it out or not. This is our year. This is our year for everybody to just take a breath, figure it out. And can you imagine with all of the wonderful things that have happened during COVID, I think the future is so bright. And so you look at your future being so bright, you don't see it at that moment that you're exhausted, but we never know what lies ahead. And so I think that that all served a purpose. So, but, but I, I, right. And I encourage, you know, athletes, and, and I always did this after summer of twirling at nationals and things, give yourself a break take you know two three weeks off before you get back into your september routine you know give your mind a break give your body a break you know give your parents a break um you know your skills you're not going to lose your skills by taking off you know two or three weeks i didn't lose my skills in taking off eight months right you know then i got back into it i found a training partner and michael cruz we taught ourselves the compulsories. Um, we figured out what a freestyle should maybe look like. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we, we went through the process. So, um, you know, I, I, I like what Cheryl said too, is everybody has to figure out what works for them. Yes. Um, there's not a right way or a wrong way to practice. Um, but you do want to practice in a way and involve your parents in a way that will make you uh, um, successful. Yes, thank you, Wendy. And you know, with you know, your mom and I, your mom and my mom were special, special something. So uh, yeah, Cheryl, absolutely. leading, so dovetailing right into the parents. What? How do you talk to parents about their engagement 
in their child's practice and how important or unimportant they are to uh, establishing a practice regimen? Well, I think it's really important. And then Wendy brought up also, you know, our use of video and everything else and cell phones that we have now. Um, and I think that, again, depending on the age, the, the student has to know how to practice and make themselves better. Like when I do FaceTime lessons, for example, 99.9% um, .9 of them, it's, it's with me and the student. I tell them, put your phone down, you know, where you can see me and we work it around. Um, the AirPods work the best right now, like in basketball gyms, you know, my kids can hear me now and I can hear them. So there's no like, what, what, what going back and forth. You know, so that helps a lot. And it helps me establish a rapport with the student. Mm -hmm. The parent has to trust me to be able to know that I'm giving them that information. And then what I do is then I communicate separately, just like a teacher with the parent to what I think that, you know, the student needs next. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really, really important to let it be the child's sport. I mm -hmm. think that's so important. I think that, um, again, there's, it, it depends on the personality and the bond between the, the parent and the athlete. It really does. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sometimes that, um, and it also depends on the age because I know again, and I don't know whether people realize this or not, but with my kids, even though I'm a coach and I'm always kind of there, I let them do their own thing. Mm -hmm. And I, when, when say for Carissa and Sean, when they went outside and, and, you know, I would kind of be invited to be outside and coaching them up to an early age. And then I stop, not that I couldn't give them the information, but I feel it's really important for a student and an athlete to learn from somebody else. I feel it's really important for them to respect authority and to learn that. And that's part of growing into adulthood. That's why I had, you know, Carissa travel to syndication for years because I wanted her how to learn how to function as a young adult. I wanted her to learn how to do time management skills. I wanted Sean to learn how to do those things. So then with the video and everything, they learned that was the best thing because then they learned to analyze themselves. They had enough knowledge and then their coaches reacted. And I'm going to take myself out of that coach for right now. Their coaches reacted. They had that rapport. And so I do the same with my students. And I might at times say, hey, look what we've learned here with the parent. This is what we've learned here. Could you please make sure that, you know, that they're practicing this? But now with videos, I required on the students, send me a video of you five times of you doing this trick. Like for us right now with videos, there's no excuse for inside, you know, evaluating. And what you were saying, Wendy, um, is is like we do rolls like today we had a really rainy day here so i pulled up my rug here i moved my glass here i had rolls all over my house chris and sean i can't tell you in our kitchen how many times we had rolls when we went to mbta world championships and they were young um very young i just we were in these tiny tiny bungalows we were told that we couldn't practice with anybody because my kids were competing against them. Yes, there are mean people like that. Um, and so I just took the furniture out of our bungalow. I stacked it all up in the rain and the freezing cold and we practiced and we had these little tiny spaces. They went outside, they twirled as much as they could till they couldn't stand it any longer because they were freezing and wet and they ran back in and they practiced. Well, congratulations, they won national championships. I mean, world championships. Mm -hmm. But but it's more for them what they learned is that you can make any situation work. So to sit there and to say there's no time to practice or there's no time for this or that, you know, no. So as a parent's responsibility, my mom always said to me, and she was my greatest teacher, was that if you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. It's up to you. But if you make your decision to do it, then you're going to do it right. Right. And, and that's the way I believe with my kids. Like I tell my kids 
every student I have at the beginning of the year, when we start again, I say, okay, what are your goals this year? What are your goals? Right. And, and each kid is, they might want to be a high school twirler. They might want to be, you know, take a year off and gain skills. They might want to be working for the university. They might want to be on the world team. They might, I don't know. So I take each student and I find out what their goals are. Mm -hmm. And then we, we figure out a plan together with the parent, with me, with the student. How are we going to get there? What's our journey going to be? Mm -hmm. So, okay. so that's. No, like it's so helpful. So helpful. And I think that it, you and I have always had the common mindset of the whole child, that you're looking mm -hmm. at the whole kid and what works for the whole kid. And one yes. size does not fit all. So also no. families and how it works in their families. So Lexi, you had to push your way through an injury. And, you know, I've always said to my students, we're in a sport. How many Olympians have you ever heard her not getting hurt, recovering from getting hurt, or there's something about an injury? So can you talk to me a little bit and talk to our audience a little bit about how you dealt with an injury and maintaining practice through it? Um, yeah, so I, which a lot of people don't know, I guess, um, I have actually two bulging discs and muscle spasms in my back, and I got it my senior year of high school. So that year, it was actually like right after um, trials is when it happened to me, and it was my first time uh, qualifying as a senior and everything like that, so I was very excited. It might, it might have been right, yeah, right after, and um, I remember just like for a while, we didn't know what it was. I just knew that I was in pain. So I had to basically like completely change my practice schedule because before I was like a lot more adamant on like doing it until I felt comfortable with the trick and everything like that. So like I wouldn't have to limit myself to only like you have to do it this many times perfectly because like you didn't, I didn't have a worry about my body or anything. Um, but then after that, it was a lot more quality over quantity for me um, because I also had to kind of monitor myself to make sure it wouldn't get any worse. Um, so that was definitely difficult in itself. And I actually didn't find out until after the world championships in August that it was bulging discs. For the whole time, they just kind of told me it was muscle spasm. So I was like, okay, it's fine. Like, it's just muscle. Like, we can figure this out. Um, and so then, like, once I figured that out, I was a PT all the time as well. I went, like, three times a week. So I really did a lot of cross training as well to kind of strengthen all my other surrounding muscles. So then when I went to twirl, it wouldn't be nearly as painful. And I had a lot more control over my body. Mm -hmm. So I, once that kind of happened, I still practiced all the time. But on top of that, I was doing a lot of PT where they were making sure that all my range of motion was good and working. And then I was also working out to make sure that those other muscles didn't give up on me as well. So it was kind of like a whole new dimension because I trained my entire life one way. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, I still love what I'm doing. I still want to keep kind of pushing myself and seeing where we can go with this. Um, but just have to be a lot smarter about everything that I'm doing rather than just not thinking about my body and the importance of it as much. Well, I think you were the master of, I think we were in Canada International Cup. And you, for a solo, said, because they take the top five or whatever number it is immediately into finals. And you were sitting there and you said, okay, I'm just going to crank out the solo and get it done because I don't want to have to do another solo. And so your strategy for doing that, where some people would go like, oh, this is a semifinal. Like, I can, like, I can do it and still make semifinals. You were driven and said, N -n -n no, I'm not doing an extra solo. Let's crank this out and get it done. So I loved that, but also you would sit there and watch the practice time and go, okay, let me see. I have like another 15 minutes. I have six minutes to rest until I get up and do it again. So your strategy, even before you were dealing with an injury, was just really smart in maximizing your time and not wasting time. And I think that's so 
incredible because with my students, I would always have them write things down to make them accountable to realize they hadn't spent 20 minutes just fluffing around. Instead, keep track of what you're doing. So I think that you were adept at mentally keeping track of like what you could do and what you needed to do. So that is just a really impressive quality that I don't know that everyone has, but your ability to do that is something to learn. So, so Grace, let's go to the next challenge. When we sit here and talk, and I heard Cheryl talking about do anything you need to do. And so, you know, like I'm, I referenced earlier, you know, I grew up in a white living room with marble tables that I worked my contact and roles and things like that. And so how did you make practice work, Grace? And how did you, what were your strategies for finding a gym? And what did you do when you couldn't find a gym, you know, in Northern Ohio in the winter? Yeah, so I am lucky enough that I was allowed into my dance studio. So I also do some dance and I, I mean, the ceiling's not high at all, but I would work on my roles. So I would use that whenever I could. And then I had a gym that I could get into sometimes, but not all the time. And it still wasn't very high. So I would try to make that work. And that was the gym I could go to most of the time. So I learned to make my tricks really tight and I was going to do the fastest triple I could so I could practice that in my solo and make sure I could get it done in my routines. But I also was very lucky that my mom was willing to drive me 40 minutes to an hour and a half to a gym. And I would find like any gym I could. And my mom really helped me with that. But when I couldn't get to a gym, the biggest thing, and I think this is the thing that helped me with my practice the most, was that I became so comfortable with visualizing my routines I would listen to the music and I would, it's funny, so I do it before I go on the floor too. And some people would be like, why are you twitching when you're listening to your music? Because I would be so into it that I would be doing my routine, even though I wasn't actually doing it. So that was the thing that really helped me the most. And also when I didn't have a gym to go into, I would perfect how I was going to put myself on the floor. And it all goes back to controlling my mind. And this is a skill that's so valuable, even outside of baton. So I came up with this statement a few years ago, and it's, I say it every time before I go on the floor, I say JV on a B with a P, and it stands for Justin Bieber on the beach with a puppy, because that's my happy time, I guess, I don't know. A few years ago, that was what made me happy, but I guess it still does. So I did that, and I'm so superstitious. I learn I was like the floors are wooden so I'm gonna knock on wood before I go into my routine and that was what calmed me down and I would talk to myself and think of statements that I could say to calm my nerves because once you can calm your nerves you can rely on the practice that you have so that's the thing like if you know you can do a no drop solo you can do a no drop solo but when nerves get in the way I feel like that's what would make my routines not as good so I would stand there and I would just tell myself, I can do this, dig deep. I can do this, dig deep. And I shut my eyes and say that before I go on the floor every time. And I would practice that outside of a competition setting to know I was really comfortable with it. So about the ritual, it's about keeping things the same. It's about, you know, and as a coach, I would always try to be very respectful of everyone's different rituals. Like your ritual is going to be different than someone else's. And I think as a coach, you just have to like step back and give them their space and let everybody figure out what their own ritual is. And then there's other times, like I've, there was a couple of students like, mm, you got to break out of this sister. This is not working. So um, I think some of those practice habits and rituals and consistency are so important. So I know we're going to go overtime tonight, and those people that need to step away, no worries. Don't worry about it. But we'll keep going, and I want to open the gallery now because I know that so many questions out there. So um, I can see most everyone. Um, If I don't see you and you're waving, go ahead and jump in. And does somebody have a question for anyone right now? Yes. Oh, Cheryl has a statement. Yes. Yeah. I do. I do want to. I do want to say something. because everybody that's spoken tonight has just been so wonderful with what you're saying. Um, And I agree with everything. One of the things that I think is really important for the competitor to know and the parent to know, and because you get this statement all the time, and um, it's like, well, when I practice it this way, I don't understand why I can't get it on the floor that way. And like Grace said, and um, the mind is so important. 
And, and I've always told those kids, you know, in three seconds, you can lose it. Everything that you've done in your mentals, like your mentals have to take you from what I call point A to point B. And as a coach and as someone to help the student practice, you know, you get them right, so to speak, in the box or in the ring for the practice, but then to get them, you know, ringside is a totally different step. So you have to be able to practice. There's practice for accomplishment of the tricks. There's practice for recreation. There's practice for performance. And then there's actually practicing mentally to be on the floor in front of that judge and that visualization and in front of that crowd and that visualization. And if you can train yourself when you've done that to reverse to where you know you can practice and visualize that judge reacting to you then you know you have it mastered and I always tell the kid one way simply like is when because I do a lot of performing arts as well and I say it's not so much just about a lyrical piece you know if I have a piece that's very serious and very you know close to someone's heart when I know that I've really put it across is when that audience member cries and gives me that tear back, then I know I've done it. And that's the same with performance. When you know you get that performance on the floor that the audience and the judge turns now and reacts to you, then you know you've been there. So it's the journey to get to that spot. And there's a lot of different processes all the way. There's not just one overnight step that happens. Don't, don't you think, Cheryl, that unless you can imagine it, you can't achieve it? So when exactly. you're practicing, if you can't imagine being in that moment in finals, or even the students that have like rehearsed standing on the podium, like I'm not a results-oriented coach, but yet if that's your motivation, to re what's it going to be like to stand on the top of the podium or get to the podium? Versus imagine that moment in finals when you have the judge who terrifies you the most. What are you going to do to win them over? So I think your point is wonderful. Who else has a question for our panel? I can see hands or everyone's shy right now. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Anna, Brian. Unmute yourself. Thanks. I'm stepping in as Casey, Anna's daughter. Thank you so much, Kyle, and everybody else who spoke tonight. Um, this was just so invaluable as a coach now, going from competitor to being on the coaching side. This, um, this is just such a necessary <coughs> resource. And so one of the things that I've struggled with implementing with our individual students um, is something that Cheryl mentioned, having video accountability, send me a trick, or send me your numbers. Kyle, I think you mentioned um, accountability through numbers. And, you know, kids are texting all the time. We know they have access to phones. So if you're getting a non-responsive child, in my mind, that means there wasn't practice. There's no output to show the coach. Um, and so as a coach, and it's hard to draw that line for each individual student, when do you stop um, kind of, I guess, not encouraging, but insisting on practice videos um, and do you ever issue some kind of ultimatum, like no follow-up lesson until you've sent this trick or this practice series? Um, you know, I, I don't want to cross the line and lose that element of self-motivation um, when you're pushing a kid too hard to practice. Um, so I just love to hear from different perspectives on that aspect. Thank you. Cheryl, um, what would be your response to that? Well, I usually do it this way. I, I try to do small things. Like, I don't want the whole routine. Sometimes I do, but I don't want, I give them small goals. So I make it, I kind of try to make it more fun for them. But I also say, all right, I want for your homework assignment is what I call it. And I don't care how old they are. I just, I just tell them, I say, for your homework assignment, I want to see three of this trick or show me this, show me this part or show me this. And a lot of times they don't want to do it at first because they're afraid, afraid of failure. So you have to encourage them through that. Like I remember one time as a student, I didn't want to practice something because I was afraid I was going to fail it. And I was a really hard worker. So then when remembering that kind of helped me as a coach. So I just encourage them and I send like smiley faces, emojis, like, you know, I say, you know, send me your video. I didn't get your video yet. I, I mean, I, I'll hound them 
Like they know it because they don't want to hear from me. And I just do it because I think, I think the kids need that. And then if they don't, then I tell them, I say, oh, hey, I didn't get your videos. And then the next lesson, you know, if they're not accomplishing the trick, then, you know, they kind of get my angry finger because <laughs> I want to see it. So then they know that it really means that. Lexi, if you were in that situation, what would, what would prompt you to respond? I feel like it's kind of hard because I feel like answering from that perspective because I haven't been into it yet. Um, I have been coaching, but nothing like on the level of any of you guys. Um, but like, I think from an athlete's perspective, they have to want it as much as you want it as a coach, if not more. So they have to have a little bit of accountability being like, well, I know that I want the help. The only way I'm going to get better is having a coach on my side. So having that mindset of, it's not like you're texting me because you're like, ex like you're expecting this and that from me, but more so like I'm expecting support from you. So it has to be a mutual respect. So then they can also achieve what they want because it's so much easier when you have people on your side and people supporting you to get where you want to get. So Grace, you could be a stubborn one. So what <laughs> is your response to that? So when you are standoffish in a competitive situation, is it because you don't feel like you're living up to it? You don't want to be bothered or um, you want to take responsibility for yourself? I think every kid's so different. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I've gotten to know myself, obviously, as I've gotten older, but I have always held myself to a very high standard in everything that I've done, whether it's academics, sports, or just really anything. So when I wasn't meeting the standard that I had in my head, that's when I would get so frustrated. Like even as you know, at our lessons, when you would give me material, I would get the, I would get frustrated because I'd feel like, no, I'm better than this. I want it harder. Like I want to reach the standard that's in my head. So I feel like for me personally, that's what I've learned about myself. And even as I've been applying to colleges this year, I like, you know, it translates into everyday life too. Like I was holding myself to such a high standard and then I had to bring it back down and be more realistic at some point. So I think that's also very important to give yourself a reality check every once in a while and look back at the progress you've made because most of the time, once you've been caught up in something, you don't see how far you've come. Okay, you know, one of the, one of the things, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, Wendy. One of the no. things in saying that, I'll say this quickly, is that um, I found that doing this to coach kids helps. I do levels one, two, three, four, five. So as I give material, I say, okay, this is like right now we're going to do this so we get this done today. And then now if you want to, level two would be add this. Level three would be add this. Level four. And then pretty soon they see because, again, they've achieved something. And then you give them a level two, you leave them a little bit hungry. And then for people that want to go farther, like Lexi said she wants to play and stuff, then you get your different levels. So a lot of times that helps kids as well. Reward. Sorry, Wendy. No, that's okay. Wendy, what did you have to add there? I just wanted to add just a couple other ideas. I mean, just I'm, I'm a fourth grade teacher, so I know that kind of sometimes kids don't always want to respond the way that you would like them to respond. So you might also want to try just maybe like a bingo sheet with tricks or things like that, that they fill in and show you the achievement, send you a screenshot. Um, something else too might, that might be fun is video yourself doing a trick and send it to them. And then, you know, okay, here's my trick. Now you send me your trick type thing. So when they see that you're, you're participating um, first, they might have a little bit more of a response, you know, in sending you back something too. I think that's, that's a great cool motivation. Um, who else? Yes, Audrey, go ahead and unmute. Mute. There we go. Well, I'm going to talk as a grandmother, as a, I was a competitor, I had two, um, two daughters that were quite successful. And of course I have a granddaughter and teaching any of those were living hell. I mean, it was horrible. Um, so I got a hold of Cheryl when 
Leanne, Arian's mom, was like seven, and Melissa, my youngest, was two. And what I learned as a parent is that you have to trust the coach. Um, I would say if you don't want to practice, you need to call Cheryl. If you don't like that trick and it's too hard, then you need to tell Cheryl. And I learned to back away uh, from them in, and just and, and trust her 100%. And by me doing that with my kids, I think I've learned, because I have my own studio, that I've learned to tell my parents that also. If your child is giving you a hard time, tell them to pick up the phone and talk to me. And I, I think that helps because as a parent, you're in a no-win situation sometimes. It's like, you know, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. I, I can remember back a long time ago, Arian refused to warm up. She absolutely refused. I was at Whipset. I didn't know what to do. We were at Nationals and she absolutely refused. And I went to Cheryl and I said, what am I going to do? And she said, let her go. And I said, do, do what? And she said, let her go. She said, if she doesn't want to warm up and she doesn't want to practice, let her go. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, I spent all this money and I'm just going to do what? And I did. I, I said, fine, you don't want to warm up, that's fine. And she got on the floor. She not only forgot her routine, but she fell. And she made a mess of it. And she came off the floor and I said, well, what did you learn? And, and I, I can remember her saying something flippy to me. And all of a sudden I said, you might want to turn around. So she turned around and Cheryl was right behind her. And Cheryl said, did you learn a lesson? And to Cheryl, she wasn't going to be flippy. And she said, yes, I did. That was the best lesson ever, you know. And I guess sometimes, you know, as a parent, you, we got to back away. I, I'm, I don't care how much, you know, I got a lot of knowledge, but not when it comes to not meant to come to my daughters and especially not my granddaughters. So I, I think, I think as I'm talking to parents, a, trust your coach. You and really it's, it's, got to you, trust your coach. Right. And you, you, you had the willingness to let her fail in that mm -hmm. moment. And sometimes that wasn't easy. And that wasn't easy. Yeah. Let me tell you, that wasn't easy, but I did. But yeah, I did. absolutely. And that, and that then gives your athlete ownership. And like I said, through my career, and I don't know about Wendy's career, you know, it's like, our moms were very much driving forces until the moment that I owned it. And I remember when I had to start begging my mom to come out and watch because she was over it. She was over coming out to the parking pad and watch and um, watching me. I think the other thing too is like conditions. Sometimes our athletes are so spoiled to conditions that they want a gym all the time. And you know, especially the Florida twirlers, you guys are outside all the time. And our northern kids just want it. They want a gym all the time. And it's like, no, if you can do it outside in the rain and the cold and wearing out tennis shoes, you can do it anywhere. So whether it's your living room, whether it's a corner. And I think that's pretty much a common thread between the good practicers and the top kids. So Lexi, did you always have a gym? I have been very fortunate. I have grown up in a gym. Like, I remember the first time that I, like, really practiced outside was when I was going to college for, like, football trailing and everything. Like, I completely was spoiled growing up, and I fully admit that when it comes to gyms. Um, I, I think it helped because of team as well. Um, and then on top of that, like, there were – there's – in Maryland, somehow didn't even know there was this many gyms until I got older. And either there was gym closures or it was just like bad weather. Like I remember even on snow days when the gyms were closed or the schools were closed, but our gyms would be open. Well, guess where we're going today? Like if you can drive out of your neighborhood, guess we're going to the gym. So I, I didn't have to go through the struggle of back and forth between gyms and outside. Um, until honestly I was older and I was on campus and then they'd be like we have no gyms open even though we have five different ones on campus they're all doing different things for this week so I'm sorry but I'm like all right well guess we're gonna learn how to practice outside <laughs> <laughs> so Wendy where did you get to practice um I practiced either outside or um during inclement weather my dad cut a beam out of the rafters in our garage so I could do a very tight four spin in there, a comfortable three spin, a tight four spin. Um, and I mean, it, you, 
it, you guys don't know this, but Kyle and I, we competed on cement floor. We didn't compete on wood floor. We competed on brushed cement floor. So our knees are wrecked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we have many holy tennis shoes. Um, I'm sure from hours of being, you know, practicing on the cement and the concrete. Oh yeah, no, I, 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 a historical story is that my, we used to buy Keds in bulk and the last summer I twirled, my mom bought 16 pair and like, cause we all, you know, our generation did six, seven and eight spins consistently yep. and yeah, spun through 16 pairs of shoes that summer, like no problem. And even when your mom was like over it, spun on your foot in the hole in the shoe. So um, who else has a question for our panel? Yes, Jill, go ahead and unmute. Um, first off, I want to say thank you to the mom coaches who, who validate my feelings of sending my kid to someone else. Um, it's, I'm glad to know other people do that. And that um, but uh, my question is, how do you motivate young twirlers? Um, like my daughter's seven. She's a novice twirler. Um, I twirl. I teach a lot of recreational students who, who are getting into competition. Um, but they're not as motivated. They, I, I'm in Alabama. So we have the Crimsonettes, who they all look up to. But as far as competitive twirling, there, there isn't that around here, except for in South Florida, closer to where Cheryl is. Uh, I'm not South Florida, South Alabama. Um, but how do you motivate those younger twirlers and the, and the novice twirlers that don't get to see twirlers like Carissa on, at a competition? I'm, I'm going to unmute uh, Michelle Brewer because um, she's a coach and daughter Kyla, and um, she has a lot of really good practice things for Kyla. Cheryl, uh, Michelle, do you mind sharing a little bit as far as how you motivate a younger twirler? Yeah, um, you know, things that we've um, definitely, you know, as everyone says, you got to find what works best for um, your child. Um, and then, you know, trial and error is, is, is definitely uh, an, many options that we've used. But, um, you know, really allowing her to set goals for herself um, has been um, really helpful and she loves to design her own practice sheets. So um, she will make a list of all the tricks or all the things that she wants to accomplish. Uh, and then she absolutely loves to go down and make little marks when she's accomplished that goal. Um, and then, you know, we, when she was younger, we did stickers. Um, we, uh, and would change week to week. And, and it would, it would, it would change. change. It would sometimes ch it'd be like chocolate, like a piece of candy. Sometimes it'd be like a penny. Sometimes it'd be like a point to earn something that she had pre-decided what it would be. Like this, this item would be a hundred points. And that was kind of how she would help design it. We, we decorated turkeys, we decorated Christmas trees, we uh, decorated Easter eggs, whatever the holiday is, we, uh, we, we got her stickers that she would earn and she would decorate it. And so I think, you know, like Cheryl said, trying to find for the younger kids a game or something that's fun that they enjoy, whether it's arts and crafts or something and, you know, setting little goals that are achievable um, uh, I think that that then instills them, you know, wanting to uh, get more goals. And to answer your question about, you know, for how you work with uh, novice kids that don't get to see twirlers like Lexi and Grace and Carissa, that thank goodness we've got YouTube now. You know, you can kind of get on there and have videos of very, uh, a lot of twirlers that, you know, do awesome things. And I think, you know, showing them you know, the best is great, but, you know, also showing them twirlers that are kind of working up to that is important as well, because sometimes they look at it and say, oh my God, I could, you know, I could never be that good. So showing them the other videos of the different stages that you take to get to that excellence, I think is also helpful. Well, I also think something was fun was, as I was like, who's going to catch, is Auntie or Kyla going to catch like the two spin first, you know, and I would give her uh, lots of tries and so it's kind of a fun way of just seeing who will catch it first or you know and again trying to make it so that she can can achieve that goal that maybe she hasn't achieved yet we're trying to find different ways to help also one thing i really liked was making a um goal which was a list of 20 tricks to earn something really big which is my ipod <laughs> yeah it i think that it's not a you're certainly never beneath bribery and one of my moms who was just genius with practice she had a prize box and so as soon as she, her daughter would like accomplish so many things 
then she got to pick a thing out of the prize box. So I think like kids don't inherently know how to set goals. I think you have to give them the tools of how to set those goals. And so it's not necessarily bribery when you're looking at a simple little prize box or you're looking at a sticker chart. It's about, you know, when we look at our kids in potty training or we look at our kids in chores, we always know that sticker charts help. And so I think we forget that when we wanna get all serious about it. And when I look at everyone on this panel and even the people in the gallery, playing is part of it. And so I know for me, I would never have been able to become the coach and choreographer if I didn't in the old day console stereo, put the vinyl record on, turn it on and just play. Like all I wanted to do was dance to the music. So let's see if that's consistent. Lexi, did you play? Yeah, I, I remember always having fun growing up. Like it, it really helped being on a team because I always wanted to do what the big kids did. And so then I even remember trying to like, clearly I was way too young to even try half the tricks that they were doing, but I remember always trying to do whatever they were doing. Um, and that kind of stuff, like I, it happened all the time, <laughs> yeah. so, but it definitely helped. So Grace, if you didn't have teammates, how did you play? Unmute, go ahead and unmute. Sorry. That's Anytime okay. I would go to nationals or a bigger competition, I would love to watch my competitors in any age group, even if they were younger or older, just because everyone does something so different and you can always learn from the people around you. So anytime I would come home from a competition, there was a, always a new spark in me that I was going to try and do what this person was doing and make it my own. So that was my favorite way to learn when I didn't have anyone around me. Isn't that the best practice, the hours following a competition? That's your best twirling. <laughs> Cheryl? Um, one of the things that I think is important, again, is what she said with, you know, like, especially like if, if you don't have team members around or anything. Um, I know, and Chris and Sean did not. And Chris and Sean were like night and day. Um, so Chris was one that I did. And actually, she still practices this way. It was little doses. 15 minutes here, five minutes there, 10 minutes there. And it's like, hey, honey, you want to show me this or show me this or show me this? And you don't always have to do it with a baton, like a pom-pom. She started baton and people don't have, they have no idea of this part, but they, it would make sense to them if they heard it. She wanted to be, her goal in life was to be Miss Fashion Model that they had at DMA. That was her goal, was to be Miss Fashion Model. And then she started the palm stuff. And then she was like, hmm, how do I win one of these banner things? I think that's kind of cool. Well, then for that, you need to do that. But even to get like her horizontals high enough, we used the poof batons, like the little, you know, so it was more the novelty things that made it fun for them. The show routines, you'll be amazed. And again, you know, I started her in gymnastics early because no matter what, if you have a strong core, you can do anything. Like, you know, Wendy was talking about too, you know, it's not just having the baton in your hand. It's, it's the dance, it's the exercise, it's playing soccer. So you're athletically in shape. All those things make the well-rounded child and make them so that they have, you know, a good brain and balance, but little doses. They also did, we did the list, which Michelle was talking about, and we did the checklist and we did the stickers and she got so many stickers one time, she did this cartwheel for me. Look at mommy, look what I won. And she had stickers like all down her crotch, around the back, like in her little outfit. You name the sticker, that was the motivator at this camp, it was great. But I also, as we did our list, then this goes back to what I was saying is, being a coach's mom and vice versa and not burning out kids. I told my kids, you finish your list and you're finished. Like you finish, I don't care how long it takes you. If you finish your list in this amount of time, you're done. I'm not going to ask you to do one more thing for the day. If you choose to go for it, but if you're not, you know, fine. And so that was a motivator right there. Get my list done correctly, mind you, but get it done correctly and I'm finished. And the other thing that was important would be they, I, they traveled with me a lot. So there was a lot of times that I wasn't spending time with them, so to speak, but they would choreograph their own routines 
and they would hide behind gymnastics mats. And then at the end, we would watch it. And so their requirement was in their choreography, they had to have, and I would list the tricks that they had to have in that routine. And then they could do whatever else they wanted with it. But then, so I was winning because they were doing these well, things. Good. I wouldn't make it too hard. Yeah. And then they were winning because they could choreograph and do whatever music or anything they wanted to. That's good. So they were constantly practicing, you know? So those were some things that I did that helped. So, Wendy, did you play? I did. You know, I, I liked what um, Lexi was saying earlier about creating new tricks. So I always kind of, especially roles, I always tried to, I like to experiment with that. But um, along with what Cheryl said, a lot of my mom would, um, you know, sign ups to go perform at the local nursing home, you know, or mm -hmm. at the park festival or whatever. And so she would usually just tell us, okay, this is the music that we're using. Go ahead and, you know, I want you to twirl one and two batons. And so then we would get to do some create and, you know, play time with that. And Paige, even though Paige is six years younger than me, um, she always found fun and practice. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, she always, <laughs> well, everybody knows Paige, so. <laughs> um, well, you know, she just always made things fun. We didn't practice together all that often because our schedules were different with the age age difference, but I I can always find fun and what Paige was doing. So if parents and coaches could feel better, so panelists, let me know. Were there times that you absolutely raise your hand if you hated practice? Was there, uh, no, was there ever a time you had to make tough choices between activities to do and practice you needed to do? I can, I can totally say, once you get into high school and if you twirl into college, you, know, you, you have to make those decisions decisions of am I going to go to the football game tonight or you know you know you have to make pieces that make you if, if you choose to say oh no I need to practice but then you're not practicing 100% that's not bringing any value to you either so um, you know be honest with yourself and it's okay if you miss a day of practice it like Lexi said it's quality practice over quantity um, mm -hmm. so, so think about that you know when you're making those choices. To go off of that some I like remember um, like starting out in college, trying to find that balance because I was going to school. I was also working. And on top of that, there was also worlds or international competitions. So trying to find that balance is like really hard, but the easiest thing for me was to hold myself accountable. So most mornings I would get up early, go to practice, then go to class, then work in the afternoons and the evenings. But I also had to tell myself to be good to myself because if your body needs a day for a break, then you can give your body a break because you're not going to have as great of a practice if you're going to go in and you're going to end up hurting yourself if you're kind of forcing your body to do things when it really needs just like, okay, give it a day. One right. day is not going to make the biggest difference in the end of the world. Just come back the next day and work even harder. And I didn't really realize all of that as much until when I got into college, just because you really had to find that perfect balance for you because it works differently for everybody. Like throughout, throughout the time that I, like a lot of people have said today about how like you have to figure out what works for the student, everything like that. And I completely agree with that. Everybody works so differently and how everything's going to be beneficial to themselves. And I found what works best for me in college, but it didn't even, I didn't even think I figured it out until probably like halfway through. And I'm like, okay, well now I, I got my groove going. I have my system down and everything. So it definitely takes time. But once you feel good with what you're doing and you have to be good to yourself as it's going, you'll feel a lot better about everything in the end. Well, and I think that um, I've mentioned this before, but like Wendy practiced with one of my best friends, Michael Cruz, and it used to be so irritating because that guy could get his practice done in a third of the time that I could. And Grace was a lot like me, that I have to get it up in my head first. And so if it took me four, five, six hours 
then that's what I needed. But other people didn't need that time. So it just depends on how your athlete learns or how they feel like they train. So um, I, we've run over, of course, because I could continue this discussion forever. Um, uh, I would, I want to say thank you, and I know that there's more to talk about. So a last statement, would you change anything? Are you, what about practice briefly to our panelists has added to the quality of your life? Uh, Grace, we'll go youngest. Okay. So I always love to tell people, this is my favorite thing to say, baton is temporary, but everything else is forever. But I have learned so much from baton and I have learned discipline. I've learned how to manage my time. I've just learned so much from the sport. So when it comes to practice, I and ever, whenever I get frustrated, I can always see how it translates to real life. And that's my favorite connection it makes. Like if I, like I'm not very good at math, but like if there was a math test I was having a really hard time with, I could see like, oh my gosh, this was like when I couldn't catch my triple. So it's, I just love to see how it could translate and how I could overcome these obstacles in a sport and in real life. So that was my favorite practice connection. Thank you, Lexi. I would not change anything. I think part of the fun of figuring out how to practice is to figure out how to practice because along the way you're not realizing that you're practicing in a way you're trying to figure out what works best for you in the end you're still working you're still working hard and you're still getting to that end point eventually that you're looking forward to so i i think the adventure is a lot of the fun um baton is one of the greatest things that has definitely ever happened to me. It's taught me so many different things in life. Like, I, I'm i partly convinced that how I got my job, too, is because I learned interview skills and how to talk to people and everything like that. So anything, any and teamwork. My job now is a lot about teamwork, and I grew up on a team. And even not being on a team, you can see in competitions how you can still interact with people and work together to kind of boost each other up because kind of like I I think Matan half the reason all of us are so like you make so many best friends it's because you're all in the same group you're all doing the same challenges you're all trying to figure out what works best for you so it's kind of cool to see that interaction as you grow older and as you all try and figure out things like I, I think it's so cool that all of us are like different ages as we're growing up and we're going to college at different years, but we're all trying to figure out how it works in our lives. But the one thing that's constant is each other. So it's kind of cool to have that over the years and you kind of never lose it. And Lexi, it just gets better. I mean, how <laughs> lucky are we that we can look at people on this call and I could go anywhere in the country and one of you are the people I could call, but I, I, if I had a flat tire. So, you know, just all of those things that are just, you're exactly right, the intrinsic connection. Wendy, is there anything you would change? I don't know, there's nothing I would change and I totally agree with what Grace and Lexi um, commented on about just the life skills piece of it. And Lexi, I know I did get my very first job out of college because of baton. <laughs> um, that's all we talked about in, I, and I fought my dad putting baton on my resume, um, you know, I had, national state national regional world baton twirling you know champion whatever and we talked about that all the time in my interview and when the guy called me and said we hired you and he said i i hired you because of your baton twirling i know you have time management skills i know you have discipline i know you're an achiever so um i i think baton and through your practice, your skills as, as an athlete and practicing, you're going to build those life skills that will take you far into the future. And I, I like thinking about this forum right now because I did twirl for over 50, I started twirling over 50 years ago. So um, to see that my practice skills from 40, 50 years ago are still relevant, um, you know, make me happy that our sport, um, while it continues to grow, we still have the foundation um, that ties it together across the years. Thank you, Wendy. Cheryl, final thoughts on practice. I think the greatest thing for practices, and I remind my students of this, and this is my favorite thing, is just when you think you can't, 
you can and you achieve. And I remind them of that constantly. I, I love to do that. Remember when that day it, you thought it was so hard and now look at you, this is easy for you. And remember that and to see the enlightenment on their faces, I love it because no matter what, once you get that trust in them, you, you know, you can take them anywhere and to watch that kid that, you know, where they started from ground one and to watch where they go and what they become, even the rest of their lives. That's just so rewarding. I just love that. Well, thank you so much. And I think it doesn't take being a national and a world champion. It's the magic. Like never forget the magic of the first time that little kid can do a flat twirl. It's just magic. And I think if you yes. don't ever forget that, then you can conquer anything in practice. And we are so lucky tonight. Thank you so very much for your time and efforts. I just get thrilled to have these talks and I know it's going to benefit a lot of people. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything. I'm delighted to do these talks and I'm so fortunate to have such expertise and such wise voices to join. So thank you. Look for this being posted on my YouTube channel and it'll be on Kyle Productions Public. So have a great night. Go forth and practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, I like everyone. that. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Peace, Cindy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.